Philippians chapter number 4. Lord willing, we'll finish up the book of Philippians here tonight. And we'll start a brand new book in a couple of weeks here. And Philippians 4 begins with verse number 1, and it says, Therefore, and so the information that he's going to give to us is based upon what he's already told us. And we spent some time at the close of last week talking about the fact that our citizenship is in heaven. If we know Jesus Christ is our Savior, we are a citizen of heaven. And it's not that we're going to be a citizen one day. We're a citizen right now. And we ought to live like we are a citizen of heaven. And we also note that our Savior is returning and we ought to be looking for Him, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing uh, the Bible tells us, and uh, he challenges these Philippian believers, and he's going to challenge us as well. So based upon what he's told us previously, he says, Therefore, my, uh, my brethren, dear, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Now notice he says they're his dearly beloved twice, talks about that they're his brother and long for my joy and crown. You can kind of see the emotion that he has for these believers. And uh, that's not unusual here in Paul's writings for him to kind of pour out his heart and let these people know, I do love you, I do care about you. And, uh, but he tells them, based upon the fact that we are citizens of heaven, that we look for that Savior, that we are to stand fast in the Lord. Now, that's word, that word stand fast there is a military term. It's the idea of holding the ground that you have conquered. And uh, we think of one of David's mighty men that stood in, the, stood in the middle of the pea patch. And he was going to hold that ground no matter how many enemies fought against him. That's the idea of what stand fast is. And uh, we're reminded in Ephesians chapter number 6, turn over there with me if you will. Ephesians chapter number 6, uh, we find some... Very similar phrasing here from the Apostle Paul goes in a, a little more depth as far as the spiritual battle that we're involved in. But he says in verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me, that utterance may be given unto me that I open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. And you notice what the Apostle Paul tells these Ephesian believers, that we're to be strong in the Lord, the power is might to, to stand. And he says, having done all to stand, in verse number 13, verse 14, stand therefore, and he goes on and says you need to stand having your armor placed upon you. And we need to come to the understanding that we are in a spiritual battle, that we do have an enemy that is facing us. And to the Philippian believers were well aware of the fact that they had an enemy that wanted to destroy them. Persecution was very real. Once you made the choice that you were going to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that you were going to be a citizen of heaven, you were a target. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are going to have a target on your back. And he says, my dearly beloved, I want you to stand fast in the Lord. And he really points to the fact, not quite as overtly as in Ephesians, but he points to the fact that it's about standing in the Lord's power and His strength and His might because our own flesh will fail us. Our own strength and wisdom will fail us, but the Lord will never fail us. And so he says, stand fast in the Lord. Good challenge that we need for the world that we live in today. He says, I beseech Euodius and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind 
in the Lord. And uh, here you have these two women that are at odds with one another. And uh, their disagreement, disagreement excuse me, threatened the unity and effectiveness of the church. And uh, disharmony is such a, a crippling thing in the church. Anytime there's a division, anytime there's a separation, uh, it's a sign that pride is there. The Bible tells us that only by pride cometh contention. And it's something that needs to be taken care of very quickly. And the, and the Scripture gives us the right way to go about that. But here he, he encourages these two ladies to cut off the bickering, cut off the arguing, and, and become in the same mind in the Lord. He says, And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, and uh, this is in the masculine form. Many people believe here he's referencing Epaphroditus, who's been described already as my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, and uh, would carry the letter uh, to Philippi. But he says, I treat thee also true yoke fellow, so whether that's Epaphroditus or whoever it is, he says, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. And uh, interesting here, the Apostle Paul says, I want you to help out these ladies who were laboring with me in the gospel. And how important it is that we all play our part in proclaiming the truth of the gospel. You have an area that the Lord wants you to reach. I have an area the Lord wants me to reach. And it's not just if you hold a certain title, position, whether you're male or female. If we know Christ is our Savior, we are all to go. And it's interesting to study, especially in the New Testament, how many women had a great impact on these churches and the spread of the gospel and the things that they were able to do. And, uh, you know, it's important for us as believers to be helping one another. You know, rather than being a disagreement, rather than bickering and arguing with one another, we ought to be helping one another. We ought to be strengthening and encouraging each other in the things of the Lord. He says, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And here we find that uh, the Lord wants us to rejoice always. Rejoice always. It reminds me of what the Bible tells us in, in Thessalonians. In everything give thanks. It doesn't necessarily say for everything. But rejoice in the Lord always. And as we talked about in the past, joy here is a fruit of the Spirit. It's something that you can only have if you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior and you are walking in a right fellowship with Him. He will produce that joy in us. It's not based upon circumstance. It's not based upon what happens in our life or whatever. That's happiness. Happiness is based on the circumstances of my life, which are constantly changing. And if we know anything about life, life has a lot of difficulties with it. If our joy is based upon how my life is going and how my day is going, I'm not going to have a lot of joy. But he says, hey, we're to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And uh, here our, our rejoicing ought to be based on the Lord Jesus Christ. No matter what I'm going through in life, I've got something to rejoice about. I know Jesus Christ is my Savior. My sins have been forgiven. I've got a home in heaven. My Savior is coming for me. There's a lot that I can rejoice about. And uh, it's something that ought to mark a true believer. We know Jesus Christ is our Savior. Yeah, we're going to have our bad days, and we're going to have our bad times and whatever else, and there is times of sorrow. But we ought to be marked as a people who rejoice in our Lord he says, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Now, the word moderation there is the idea of gentle or patient. And you notice the fact that their lifestyle was to be known unto all men. There's certain things that you as a Christian ought to be known by. There's a lot of things we ought not to be known by. And he says, your testimony is so important. You ought to be known as somebody who is gentle, who is patient. As he just said, rejoicing in the Lord always. There's certain things that ought to characterize your life, and people be, ought to be able to see it. 
And he tells them that they ought to live in such a way because the Lord is at hand. And I believe that's very true. At any moment, our Lord could be coming for us. And uh, it's important for us to have a good testimony as we seek to be a witness uh, to those who are around us. He says, be careful for nothing. And the word careful there is the idea of anxious. And uh, boy, we, we like to worry, don't we? I mean, we worry about stuff that's not even going to happen. What if it happens, and this and that, and we play out all the scenarios in our mind, and man, we can just allow worry and fear to totally dominate our lives. We worry about what someone thinks about us. We worry about what they're going to say, and we worry about the weather, and we worry about, you know, all sorts of things. But here, Paul tells these believers, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. First uh, Peter 5, 7, you know it very well, it says, Casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. And uh, rather than worrying about things, rather than getting anxious, God wants us to come to Him. He wants us to pour out our hearts to Him. You've got something coming up, and you, maybe you're a little worried or timid or anxious or whatever. You ought to take that to the Lord. Rather than churning it over in your mind over and over and over again, give it over to the Lord. The Lord longs for us to pour out our heart to Him, to give us that burden and that care. Someone said, worrying is assuming a responsibility that God didn't intend for you to have. And uh, how true that that is. God wants us to take things to Him and let Him handle the details. And uh, He says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And so He notes the effect that if we choose to turn our hearts over to the Lord, there's something that is going to take place that the peace of God is going to come over us. And he talks about the fact that it is a peace that passes all understanding, that's going to keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Paul told another church that they were to let the peace of God rule in their life. And the idea is that the peace of God would call what's in bounds and what's out of bounds. That it would call the plays in your life but here he says, once we turn things over to the Lord, He will give us that peace. But it's a peace that only He can bring. It's a peace that only He can give. That's one of the things that He promised that He would do. And, um, you know, I, there's been times in my life where I haven't gone to the Lord. I haven't trusted Him as I ought to, and I've just kind of worried. And, you know, you get that sick feeling in your stomach, and it just kind of turns over and over and over again. There's been other times where... I've had the mindset to turn my heart over to the Lord, to, to turn my burdens over to Him. Difficult situations in life that I felt that peace, where in a human standpoint, I should have been afraid. I should have been worrying. I should have been upset. And I'm sure there's been times of your life where you felt that way. It's been, you know, one of the things as a pastor is you go in and you visit with people who are having surgery and illnesses in the hospital and whatever else, you know, there's some people that you just, you go and visit and you can just tell, man, the peace of God is there. You know, I'm not worried about it. I'm ready to go home to be with the Lord if that's what He wants from me. And man, it's just amazing to see someone who has given complete trust and turned that burden completely over to the Lord. And He has given them that peace there that passes all understanding, that will keep your hearts and minds through Christ, that that peace is going to guard your heart and mind through the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And one of the things that he encourages these believers to do is to 
take things over to the Lord and then to contemplate and to dwell and to meditate upon the things that are true and good and right. Rather than worrying about the negatives, that's what worrying is. It's thinking about the, bad, the worst thing that could happen in that scenario and dwelling upon that. Rather than dwelling on the negatives, we need to dwell on the positives, the things that are true and right. Now, for some people, that's easier than other people. I mean, some people, like myself, are you just kind of bent, you just lean towards the negative for whatever reason. Now, my wife, she's positive. I mean, it, everything's positive. Uh, but I've got to work to think positively. I've got to work and concentrate to think about the good. And here he, he tells these believers to stop dwelling on the evil, stop dwelling on the negative. Turn those things over to the Lord. Instead, you think about what's true. You think about the things that are honest, that are just, that are pure, that are lovely, that are of a good report. He says you think on those things. And that's a conscious choice that we have to make. To choose to think about the things that are pure and lovely and of a good report. Verse 9, he says, Those things which ye have both learned and received, and heard, and seen in me, do. And the God of peace shall be with you. And once again, he encourages them to follow the good examples that are put in front of them. Uh, we looked last week, Philippians 3.17, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as you have us for an ensample. And so he says, hey, you follow the example, what you've learned, received, heard, seen. And then he says, do it. That's a personal imperative. He says, you see the example, you know what I've done, you know what I've taught you, you know what is right, do it. Now do it. Follow the pattern. Follow the example that's in front of you. And of course, we always talk about the fact the Apostle Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. We don't just blindly follow anyone. But he said, hey, you can look at my life and you know and see that what I'm doing is right. And so follow that example. And he says, if you will do that, you'll follow the proper example that's been laid out in front of you. He says, the God of peace shall be with you. And you look at the Apostle Paul's life and if anybody had a reason to worry, it was the Apostle Paul. If anybody had the reason to fear and to think negatively, I mean, one of the things that we talked about in our Corinthian study was the fact that every town that Paul went in, he knew what was going to happen. He was going to go in, he's going to preach the truth, and, and people weren't going to like it. And so he was going to be whipped, he was going to be beaten, he was going to be thrown in prison. They were going to try to kill him. Why? Because for preaching the truth. That's what he knew about every town that he was going to go in. That's why the Apostle Paul said, pray for me that I, I may speak the things that I ought to speak. He was, he was prone to fear. He was prone to worry. He was prone to some of these things. But he had also learned how to have victory over that. He'd learned to turn things over to the Lord and to put his faith and trust in the Lord. He had learned to think on the things that are pure and lovely and a good report. He says, listen, follow that example that I have set before you. And if you do that, the God of peace shall be with you. And he wasn't just saying that. He knew that from personal experience. I mean, you've got to have a lot of faith and a lot of confidence and a lot of peace from the Lord to step into the next town after you've been stoned to death. It came from personal experience. And he says, the same God that gave him the peace will give you the peace as well. He says, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. And so here he talks about the fact that this church was such a help and a blessing to him. They met many of the needs that he had. And um, the reason he, he talks about the fact that he's rejoicing in the care that they've given to him. And uh, he says in verse 11, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And one of the things the Apostle Paul is quick 
to point out is the fact that he was not just using people. And there's a lot of people in this world that will use some sort of title or position or spirituality to use and abuse people. And the Apostle Paul was very clear about that. And so he lets them know, I'm not, I'm not telling you about this. I'm not bringing up the fact of your gifts and whatever else because I want to take advantage of you. Because I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And the idea of contented with one's lot, with one's means, though the slenderest. And he says, I know both how to be abased. That's the idea of being, of, of being at the very bottom. He says, I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. The Apostle Paul had had times where he was in great want. He's also had times where he was in abundance. But the thing that he pointed out was the fact that whatever the circumstance he found himself in, he was okay with that. If God had him walking through a time in his life where he was suffering great want and there was difficulties and whatever else, he's, he's okay with that. He's fine with that. There were times where he had abundance. Probably not a whole lot. But he said, I'm okay with that too. That he wasn't looking to get out of the circumstance that he was in. He was just fine with wherever the Lord had him and whatever he had him going through. And uh, here we get to verse 13 that is so misquoted and misinterpreted. It says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And once again, we have to look at the context of what's going on here. There's a lot of people that, you know, they... they throw the winning touchdown in the Super Bowl and whatever else. Well, I can do all things through Christ. Well, that's, that's good, but that's not what the verse is meaning. It has to do with contentment. He said, listen, I can do it. Whatever road the Lord has me walk through, if He has me walking through hardship and He's got me walking through a time of great want and poverty, I can do that. If for whatever reason the Lord chooses to bless me, chooses to bless my family, and we've got an abundance... I can walk that road too. He said, I can do it. It's not necessarily a promise that that we can do anything. Well, we can do whatever He wants us to do. And He will give us the strength to do that. But here He points out, and specifically talking about being content there with the place and the way that God has our lives at that moment. He says in verse 14, Notwithstanding, ye ye have well done, that he did communicate with my affliction. Uh, and they gave to help Paul in a time of need. And I think of those that have given to help in a time of need that I have. I had one of our teenagers in Alabama, uh, Anna Carson, who uh, without my knowledge, and it took me some, some investigating to finally figure out who did it, one Wednesday night after church, we went out to our car and it was, it was full of food. And... We made $19,000 a year in Alabama, and there was a lot of times we didn't know what we were going to eat. And uh, the cupboards were empty, and we ate a lot of ramen, a lot of hamburger helper with no hamburger, and uh, all those things. And uh, I remember just going out to a car, and it was just full of food. There was a cooler in there that had steaks and all kinds of stuff that we would never, ever be able to afford for ourselves. And here this teenager had used her babysitting money to provide for us. You know, so when the Apostle Paul talks about communicating in his affliction, just the joy that is in his heart. Every time I see that girl's picture on Facebook, you know, it just brings, almost brings tears to my eyes thinking about how God used her in, in, to take care of our family. But he says, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, No church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. And you look at that phrase, but ye only. Now, how sad was that? How sad was it that they were the only church that helped him out? I mean, he had given a lot for these people. He wasn't asking for something, uh, but here he'd sacrificed a lot to help these believers to start these churches. And, uh, but... What a testament to this church that they were 
willing to help out. They loved and they cared for the Apostle Paul, and it wasn't just something they said. They proved it by the way that they treated him and helped him out in a great time of need. And he says, For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity. And it wasn't even just a one-time thing, and then they forgot about Paul and kind of patted themselves on the back because they were able to help. No, he said once and again they continued to provide during his time of once. And I believe God used them in a great way to be a blessing and a help to the Apostle Paul to do the work there in Thessalonica, which was a difficult work as well. He said in verse 17, Not because I desire a gift, but, as, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. And by giving to the Apostle Paul, they were investing in the work of the Lord. They had a part in everything that was done in Thessalonica. Why? Because they ministered to his needs there. They were a help and a blessing to him. And so they had a part, I believe, in all the work that God did through the Apostle Paul in that place. And he says, uh, But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. And you can just kind of sense in this verse what an encouragement it was. What a blessing. You know, I think back when I was in college and how that every once in a while I'd get a package. Most of my packages came from Lysandra. And uh, she'd bake me fresh cookies and all this stuff and, and letters and whatever else. And man, getting that package was such a boost and such an encouragement. Uh, it's something we've tried to do uh, for the college kids that we have in our church is every so often try to make sure they get something, whether it's a package, a gift card, or whatever. Just give them that little bit of encouragement. And here the Apostle Paul, you can just kind of tell, be thinking about what these people had done for them was such an encouragement and it wasn't just an encouragement and a good thing for the Apostle Paul. He talks about how their sacrifice was pleasing to God. He says that it had a, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. And because they were willing to sacrifice and they were willing to give, the Apostle Paul had a promise for them in verse number 19. Well, once again, this is another verse in, in Philippians 4 here that's often taken out of context and misapplied. He told these believers, because of your sacrifice in the Lord, but my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And he points out the fact, because you were faithful to give, because you were faithful to sacrifice, God will provide for you. He will take care of you. Matthew 6, 31 and 33, Jesus says this, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And Jesus points out the fact, if you seek the kingdom of God first, He'll take care of the food. He'll take care of the clothing. He'll take care of the needs. And that's exactly what these Philippian believers did, is they were seeking the kingdom of God and His righteousness first. They were willing to sacrifice to help the Apostle Paul, to help the ministry there. And because they sought God first, the promise is given that God would supply their needs. If I'm not living for the Lord as I ought to, if I'm not seeking first the kingdom of God, I can't take Philippians 4.19 and say, you know what, God's going to provide for all my needs anyway. No, this is a specific promise given for a specific uh, purpose in what they had done. And uh, so uh, we ought to be a people who seek the kingdom of God first. He says, now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And this is our entire purpose in life is to bring glory to God. We ought to live every day of our life asking the question, how can I glorify God the greatest today? Reminded what the Lord Jesus Christ said. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. That's the job that we've been given to do, to lift up and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. He says, salute every saint in Christ Jesus. 
the brethren which are with me greet you. All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. And what a thought there about those that came to Christ in Caesar's household. All because the Apostle Paul was in prison. If he had never been in a prison in Rome, they probably never would have heard the gospel. I mean, think of the effect that he was able to have because he didn't just think about himself in times of difficulty, in times of hardship. No, his whole life was about glorifying God, about lifting him up in the circumstances. And so, a wonderful thought. It'll be interesting to see, hopefully when we get to heaven, we'll have an opportunity to know all those that he had the impact on. Verse 23 says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And here the, the Apostle Paul closes out the book in a similar way that he opened it, with grace. Remember what he said in Philippians 1, verse number 2. Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And he closes out with that same opening. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Grace. That's what the Apostle Paul was holding on to. As he had already mentioned before, he, he, he tried the works route. He tried earning God's favor for himself. But there came a time and there came a day where he said, that's not going to work. I'm trusting in Jesus Christ and Him alone. His grace to save me. And it was his, that grace that sustained him in his life through all the difficulties, all the traveling, all the testings and trials and everything else the Apostle Paul went through. It was God's grace that sustained him. And that's the same grace that will sustain us. The same grace that saved us is the same grace that will sustain us and help us to live the Christian life the way we ought to. What a wonderful thought there as he kind of brings that, that grace full circle here. And he encourages these believers and says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.